hello, hello everybody. My name is David Tate and welcome to Now Let's Be Honest. This is part 14 of our Lives of the Apostles series where we're walking through the lives of the 12 apostles in three different ways. First, we're talking about their fictional storylines in the TV show, The Chosen. Then we're talking about what we know about their lives from the text of scripture. And then lastly, we're talking about what we might or might not know about their lives from the traditions that developed in the early years of the early church. Today, we are going to be talking about our 10th apostle out of 12. So we're almost coming to the end of this series. So far, we've talked about Simon Peter, his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, his brother John. We've also talked about Philip and Nathaniel slash Bartholomew. We've talked about Matthew slash Levi, and we've talked about Thomas, and we've talked about James, son of Alphaeus. Today, we're going to be talking about the apostle named Thaddeus, who you also might know as Jude or Judas, son of James, and we're going to be talking about that controversy very, very early on. I have really been enjoying going through these series, and I just got to say, I'm kind of sad that it's coming to an end. I do have a few things planned for after we finish this series, some stuff that I think you'll be very excited about, and I think hopefully something that will help you really grow in your relationship with God and also in your understanding of Scripture, because that's really my whole goal with this channel. I want to speak honestly about the Bible and about everything we can say regarding the people in the Bible, all stuff like that with my ultimate goal of helping you fall more and more in love with Jesus Christ. That's my whole goal here. And so I do have some stuff planned after this series that I think will help you with that. And also, for those of you who are fans of The Chosen, it'll help you understand that show even more, which was also kind of one of my goals in this whole series. But that being said, I'm just going to pray for us right off the bat. I'm just going to start praying for us so that we can hop right in and start talking about Thaddeus. Dear Lord, thank you so much for allowing us to gather here today. We praise you. We exalt you. We love you. We know that we don't deserve you, God. We pray that as we go into this study, we won't do this purely for intellectual benefit, but we'll do that and we'll go through this purely for the fact that we want to pursue you more and we want to desire you more, God. And that is the most worthwhile thing we can commit our time to. And so if this study will help draw us closer to you, I pray that you will bless it. I pray that your spirit will be present with us and then allow us to learn. We love you, God. We thank you for everything that you have done in this world, everything that you are doing in this world right now, and everything that you will do in the future to bring all people to your glory. We love you, God. We thank you for these men that you chose to take your gospel to the nations, and we praise you for the debt that we owe them for fulfilling your will through them. We pray that you will also allow us to fulfill your will in us as well, God. Thank you so much, Lord. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's get started by talking about Thaddeus according to The Chosen. Thaddeus and his friend James are introduced when they make a surprise visit to Mary Magdalene's home for her first time hosting a Sabbath dinner. When she voices her uncertainty over whether or not she is doing things correctly, they reassure her that everything looks just fine. When Jesus also makes a surprise appearance, Thaddeus and James greet him as rabbi, and it's revealed that they are some of his students. Together, the group sits down as Mary begins to lead them through the Sabbath customs. A few days later, Thaddeus, James, and Mary are gathered with a group of fellow Galileans as Jesus teaches them on the shore of the lake. They watch as Jesus introduces himself to some fishermen returning from a night of catching nothing, and then rejoice with the fishermen when Jesus miraculously causes them to catch a great multitude of fish, calling them to be his disciples shortly thereafter. The group make their way to Cana, where they attend a wedding and begin to bond with one another. When the leader of the group, Simon, voices that he wasn't even a student looking for a rabbi, James responds that he wasn't either, but it was Thaddeus who introduced him to Jesus, making Thaddeus the first of all the disciples to meet Jesus. Thaddeus reveals that he, as a stonemason, first met Jesus at a construction site while they were busy building a bathroom. Later that evening, Mary Magdalene asks if his father was a stonemason also, but Thaddeus says that he was not. His father was a smith, but Thaddeus chose to apprentice under a stonemason at the age of nine. He reflects that masonry isn't harder, but it is more final. If the smith wants to change something that he's making, he needs only to put the iron back into the fire to reshape it. But when a mason begins chiseling away, there's no going back. Little does he know it, but as Thaddeus is speaking, Jesus is doing some masonry of his own. In turning water to wine, he is kicking off his public ministry, and there will be no going back. As the group makes their way back to Galilee, Jesus instructs Thaddeus to prepare enough wood for five days, which Jesus explains is not for them, but for the next weary traveler who comes along. 
When the time comes for the group to start traveling again, Thaddeus and James are the first to arrive with Jesus, shortly thereafter accompanied by the rest of the group. Together the group makes their way down to Samaria, where Jesus reveals his identity as Messiah to a woman by the well, and they collectively walk into the town ready to start some trouble. After spending a few days in Samaria, a dispute breaks out between the group as they sit around the breakfast table. When John expresses his frustration over arguing about where Jesus is going each and every day, Thaddeus suggests that perhaps John should just stop arguing, a comment which causes John to storm out in frustration. A few days later, the group is traveling through the Bashan when Thaddeus comes across Matthew, the former tax collector, sitting underneath a tree. Of all the members of the group, Thaddeus shows the most intentional effort of being nice to Matthew, and he asks Matthew what he's writing about. Matthew tells him that he's decided to start documenting the various things that he has seen while following Jesus, something which began as a chore but has turned into a habit. Thaddeus says that prayer is a lot like that. It was something that was laborious at first, but now he has come to love that. Just as Matthew expresses the value of writing things down, Simon comes up and voices his frustration. He thinks this is a terrible idea and that Matthew shouldn't do it. When Simon walks off, Thaddeus points out that he isn't entirely wrong, and he warns Matthew to be careful. The group continues to bond as they sit around a campfire in Syria. Thaddeus talks about how he used to be terrible at praying until recently, but that he has grown to love it now that Jesus has given him further instruction. When the conversation turns to the food laws, he reveals that one time while traveling through a Gentile marketplace, he tried pork, and it was absolutely marvelous. A little while later, once the group has returned to Galilee, Thaddeus and James, along with Nathaniel, are tasked with finding a location for Jesus to preach a big sermon that he has been preparing. James suggests that they use the rolling hills of Chorazin, but Nathaniel thinks that the hill would be too far a climb, and Thaddeus adds that this would be too far a distance from Tiberias and Magdala. When they come across a completely repellent area with unwelcome hosts, Thaddeus, far more familiar with Jesus' character than any of the others, comes to the conclusion that this is probably the right spot, much to Nathaniel's confusion. They initially have difficulty convincing the landowner to lend them the land, but the situation is resolved whenever a businessman and his protege come to their aid. Upon acquiring the land, the trio departs, and they spend the next few days spreading the news that, on the third day, Jesus of Nazareth will be preaching on the heights of Chorazin. When the day finally arrives, Thaddeus stands next to little James as Jesus mounts the stage that they built so that he can begin to preach his sermon on the mount. All right, well, now that we have talked about Thaddeus according to the Chosen, it's time for us to move into my favorite portion of these videos, and let's talk about Thaddeus according to the text of Scripture. And like with some of these other apostles, what we're going to have to do before we can actually talk about Thaddeus' biographical information is we have to answer a multi-millennia long debate. Is Thaddeus the same person as Judas, son of James? And also, this is a big bit of a debate as well, does Judas of James mean Judas, son of James? Some people would interpret this as Judas, brother of James, but I'm really not going to spend that much time addressing that question. I'm just going to kind of assume this is Judas, son of James, because that seems to be the typical understanding of that whenever you encounter this particular phraseology in the Greek New Testament. But yeah, so is Thaddeus Judas of James? This is going to be something that's going to inform a bit of our study today, and so we need to spend a little bit of time on it. And these are the basic facts about it, right? First and foremost, Thaddeus is identified by Matthew and Mark as a member of the Twelve in the third group alongside James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot. So whenever, we're going to see these lists a little bit later on in this study. But whenever you actually read, there's uh, the four different lists of the 12 apostles found within the Gospels and in Acts. We have a list in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and in Acts. We don't have a list like this in John. In those four different lists, we have 12 disciples listed, and pretty much all of them are the same, but some of them seem to be referred to by different names. Matthew and Mark identify one guy in particular as a guy named Thaddeus. However, whenever you get to Luke's lists, which are found both in Luke and in Acts, he's identified as Judas, son of James. Judas, the son of James, is identified by Luke as a member of the Twelve in the third group alongside James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot. And so whenever you compare these lists, you'll see that both of these guys, Thaddeus and Judas, son of James, they're found in the third group of the Twelve, because it seems like they're portioned off in four different groups, with Simon Peter being the leader of the first group, Philip being the leader of the second group, and then James, son of Alphaeus, being the leader of the third group. And both of these guys are found in these, this third group alongside James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, which would lead us to believe that these two people are one and the same. Thaddeus equals Judas, son of James. But what more can we say in addition to this? In the Gospel of John, we do have a disciple being mentioned who is identified as Judas, 
not Iscariot, which is actually kind of funny, and we'll talk about that later on in this video. But John does identify that there is an apostle named Judas, not Iscariot, and the reason why we know he's an apostle is because he's present at the Last Supper, an event at which only the 12 apostles were present at. We're going to actually spend a lot of time on this particular moment later on in this study, but there is this character named Judas, not Iscariot, and he shows up at the Last Supper and in the events that follow that. And we know from the other Gospels that only the Twelve were present at this event, which means that Judas, not Iscariot, seems to have been a member of the Twelve, which would seem to identify him with Judas, son of James, because there was only one other Judas in the group that we know of. There was Judas, Iscariot, and then there was Judas, not Iscariot, a.k.a. Judas, son of James. So really the big question is, is Judas, son of James, Judas, not Iscariot, Thaddeus? Are these people one and the same? Right now, I would tell you, if we only had this information, I would say that we have good reason to think that they are the same just because it's all lining up. But let's go even further than this. Judas is a Hebrew name, and there was at least one pos uh, one or possibly two other members of the 12 named Judas. That's a little bit of a typo there. It's supposed to say possibly, not possible. Uh, there was at least one other member of the 12 named Judas. And I put possibly two there because if you remember in our video on Thomas... Uh, some of the early traditions say that his name was also Judas. It was Judas Thomas, hence why he went by the name Thomas, which would have been a nickname for him. It means the twin. Uh, but we know for sure there was at least one other Judas, and so it makes sense that this Judas might have had to go by a different name, right? He would have gone by a nickname. Well, that brings up the question, is Thaddeus a nickname? It just so happens that Thaddeus is a Greek name that could serve as a nickname. And so all of this does seem to line up fairly well. Judas would be his Hebrew name, Thaddeus would be his Greek name, and since there was already another Judas in the group, he chose to go by his Greek name. That would make a lot of sense, and therefore, my conclusion would be that we have good reason to believe that Judas, not Iscariot, the son of James, is the same person as Thaddeus. But this is the stuff that we have to wrestle through whenever we're working through these Gospels, because sometimes we just read them, and we just take it for granted that they are one and the same, or some people might read this stuff, and depending on your philosophy of the Bible, depending on how skeptical you are, if you're going into Scripture with an understanding and an appreciation of the fact that it is inspired by God, or if you're going into it with a skeptical mindset, you might have two different perspectives. You might either say, okay, these reconcile through the same person, or you might think immediately, these contradict, therefore the Bible's false. I'm spending time breaking this down because I want to show you that they actually do align with one another. And so if you are one of those skeptics, I'm just going to encourage you to maybe dial back the skepticism just a second because it's not like these are contradictions, right? There's a very clear distinction between contradictions and places that might not perfectly align because sometimes places that don't align, they can be explained away. And I think that's something that we see in the text of scripture. A contradiction is vastly different. A contradiction is if I said, this shirt is black, and then if I said, this shirt is not black. That's a contradiction because those two things cannot be true at the exact same time. A lot of times whenever people raise up contradictions in the Bible, they're not actually talking about contradictions. They're just talking about things that have to be wrestled through to see if they can line up. I believe there are no contradictions in the Bible, but I do believe there are some things you do have to wrestle through. And so that's why I spend time on this. But that being said, there's my opinion on that, but I do want to share some other people's opinions. There are various theories uh, regarding the fact that maybe these were different people, and some people suggest that Thaddeus was an original member of the Twelve who dropped out later, and, who dropped out at some point, and later on Judas, son of James, replaced him in the group. And this would be based off the theory that maybe Matthew and Mark are writing their Gospels a little bit earlier, and they're talking about Thaddeus, but since he dropped out, later on, uh, whenever Luke was writing Luke and Acts, he identified Judas, son of James, because that's the guy who ultimately took Thaddeus' spot. I think that's kind of a stretch, and I don't think we have any precedent for that. It seems like whenever Jesus t chose these 12 people, it was a fixed group. It wasn't something that you could just go in and out of. And so it does seem to me like that's a bit of a, a stretch, but, you know, we can allow it. Um, that is another way that this could possibly make this true, but I just don't think we have any reason to actually think that. And then some people propose that the 12 wasn't a fixed group, but actually changed now and then. And so these people, that's how they would actually explain a lot of the different names that we see in the 12. So whenever you see Nathaniel or Bartholomew and stuff, they, they'd say, okay, well, maybe it wasn't a fixed group. But to me, it does seem in the text of scripture, it is a very fixed group because Jesus goes up on a mountain he prays, he comes back down, he appoints 12 apostles, and it seems like from that point onwards, this was a fixed group of 12. And so to me, I would lean away from the theory that these are two different people, 
Rather, I would lean towards the idea that maybe they are one and the same and we just have to wrestle through how they possibly could be. And I think with Thaddeus, it's actually a lot easier than some of the others. Like the whole Matthew Levi thing, that's a little bit harder to explain. Or the Philip Bartholomew, that's even harder. Or even some of the stuff we saw with James and Little James and stuff like that. That stuff's a little bit more difficult. This one does seem very straightforward to me, mainly because Judas is a Hebrew name. We've got another Judas. Thaddeus is a Greek name. It makes a lot of sense that he would have just gone by his Greek name rather than being confused with Judas Iscariot. Uh, you also probably wouldn't want to go by that name too commonly, uh, especially once um, you know, Judas becomes synonymous with betrayal. But yeah, so that is what I believe there. I do think we have good reason to think that Thaddeus and Judas and James are the same people. And for that reason, as we go throughout the rest of this study, I am going to assume they are one and the same. Because if they're not one and the same, we know practically nothing about Thaddeus other than the fact that he was a member of the Twelve. If he is the same as Judas, not Iscariot, we know a little bit more. We have at least one moment where he does speak. And so... If you think that these are two different people, just discount that part and just whenever I talk about it, just realize those are two different people. But I do believe they're the one and the same. And so that's going to kind of guide this study because I think we have good reason to believe that. Let me read what Richard Bauckham says in Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, though. Uh, if you have been with this study very long, you'll know that I quote him a whole lot, a whole lot. And that's because this book has been very, very useful. Uh, and it's actually been very groundbreaking in the realms of scholarship in regards to how we view the Gospels. And I don't agree with everything he says. I actually disagree with quite a lot of what he says, but I really appreciate his philosophy of doing this stuff. I do think sometimes he gets a little too scholastic for his own good and that sometimes he can overstate his case or he can just kind of run with a theory that um, he, he kind of just gets um, blinded, like he kind of just gets pinpointed in on one thing and then he has a incapability of seeing things beyond that one perspective. But in this case, I do think he makes a fair point. Um, he says this, it is not at all improbable that the same man who should have been called both Judas, Yehuda, and Thaddeus, Tadai. The two names may, may well have been treated as sound equivalents, just as Joseph or Jesus and Justice, Reuben and Rufus, Jesus and Jason, Saul, Hebrew Shaul, and Paul, Latin Paulus, evidently were. So he's saying that these actually could have been very similar names, like to where they would have actually been treated as equivalents, both in Hebrew and in Greek, because of how Yehuda and Tadai, they kind of sound a little bit like each other. They might have actually been considered equivalents. He continues to say, A member of the Twelve named Judas would certainly need to be distinguished in some way from the other member of the Twelve who bore his name. To distinguish him from Judas Iscariot, this Judas could have been identified by his patronymic, Judas son of James, Yehuda bar Yaakov, or alternatively, he could have been known by his Greek name, Thaddeus, Tadai. Both alternatives could have been used in the two versions of the list of the twelve. The two, the one preserved in Matthew, uh, in Mark and Matthew are the, oh sorry, the ones preserved in Matthew and Mark and the ones in Luke and Acts have adopted different alternatives. So he's pointing out that actually the two options that would have probably been readily available to him are utilized in both of these different accounts. We do have the patronymic, Judas, son of James, and then we also have the Greek name, Thaddeus, appearing in both, and so we get, like, this was what we would expect if people were needing to be distinguished. He continues to say, Possibly, as Jeremiah suggested, after the defection of Judas Iscariot, it would seem preferable to call his namesake, who remained a member of the Twelve, Thaddeus rather than Judas. Luke's usage, Judas, son of James, was perhaps how he was styled in an official written list of the Twelve, whereas Thaddeus was how he was more commonly known. And so at the very end there, he's just proposing different reasons why they might have put different things. Why did Matthew and Mark put this? Why did Luke put this? Luke might be putting the official name. His name is Judas, son of James. This is how he was officially known, whereas Thaddeus might have been the name he was more commonly known as because you would kind of try to distance yourself from the name of Judas after Judas is scary it betrayed Jesus. And so I think that's a pretty good conclusion there. And I really do, once again, I can't... Um, I can't recommend Richard Bauckham's book enough. He does a very good job with all of that stuff. And so be sure to go buy it if you want. Uh, it's, it's very scholarly, but I think it's scholarly in a very intriguing way. Um, and like I said, I don't agree with everything. There's a lot I don't agree with, but I still do encourage us to kind of read stuff like that. But that being said, now that we've answered that, we can move on to Judas's or Thaddeus's biographical information. So let's talk about that. First and foremost, oh, wow. First and foremost, <laughs> first and foremost, his name was Judas slash Jude. Uh, this comes from the Hebrew word Yehuda, and it comes from the Greek word Yudas, and this word means praised. 
Uh, this is the name that we encounter both in Luke and in Acts, and also we find it later on in the Gospel of John and stuff like that. But Luke and Acts specifically identify him as Judas, son of James, and in there, the Greek text is Judas, and that comes from the Hebrew word Yehuda. One thing we need to address is, why is it Judas or Jude? Are these not two different names? And really, no, they're not. <laughs> they're the exact same name, but some people choose to refer to Thaddeus as Jude rather than Judas, simply to distinguish him from Judas Iscariot. In Greek, they are the same exact name, and so if you see some Bible translations that call this guy Jude, or if you see some traditions calling him Jude, they're actually the same name. It's just trying to distinguish him from Judas Iscariot. We actually see this with the letter of Jude later on. Uh, it's actually not by this guy. But it is just a, uh, it's another form of Judas. The name Judas itself is actually Hebrew Yehuda, and it was the fourth most common name of that time period, just behind the names Lazarus, Joseph, and Simon. Simon was the most common name. We've talked about that a lot with Simon Peter. We'll talk about it again next time when we talk about Simon the Zealot. Uh, but that was the most common name, and right behind that was Joseph. Right behind that was Lazarus. And then fourthly was Judas. One of the reasons the name was so popular was likely because of Judah Maccabee, or Judas Maccabeus, which means Judas the Hammer. And this guy was the one who led the Maccabean revolt against the Seleucid Empire in the second century. So this was like the formative moment for the Jewish people in the intertestamental time period. If you have like the Apocrypha, if you're Catholic, you'll probably have the Apocrypha in your Bible. We don't hold to that as Protestants, but I still think it's very useful text to read. Then you have the book of 1st and 2nd Maccabees. This tells the story of the Maccabean or Hasmonean family. And they were leading this rebellion against the Seleucid Empire to reclaim Israel and reclaim Jerusalem for God. And this ultimately culminated in 164 BC, where they led the successful revolt and they recaptured Jerusalem and they cleansed the temple and the pagan altars. And then the family entered into Jerusalem to rededicate the temple, an event that was commemorated as the Feast of Dedication, also known as Hanukkah, which Jews celebrate to this day, because this was a huge, huge deal. And you actually hear about Jesus celebrating this in, I believe, John chapter 10, right? And so that's where Judah and a lot of these names became very, very popular because six of the nine most popular names in the first century Israel were those of the Maccabean family. Mattathias was the father of that family. And then he had five sons, John, Simon, Judas, Eleazar, and Jonathan. He might have actually had more sons than that. But, uh, no, I think he probably did just have five sons. But all of those names became very, very popular names during the first century and during the time since the Maccabean revolt because these were the celebrities of Jewish culture, right? And so it makes a lot of sense that these would have been the most popular names because it's kind of like the same thing in our culture nowadays. The celebrities, they're the ones who kind of have people named after them because they become very popular names. You hear them all the time and that's what you get named. And so Judah, it makes a lot of sense because Judah Maccabee, he actually was the one who led the group. He was Judah the Hammer. And a fun fact about The Chosen, if you go back to season one, the pub they went to a lot of the times was called The Hammer and this was actually named after the Maccabean family. It was named in honor of them. Ultimately, however, the name comes from the Hebrew name Judah, which was the fourth child of Jacob, right? So when we go back to Judah, Judah Maccabee, that's probably why this Judas would have been named that name. But really, the name Judas ultimately comes from Judah, and that was the fourth, um, not the fourth, that was the, uh, this, yeah, the fourth, why do I have the fourth child of Jacob? Oh, yes, he was the fourth child of Jacob. Sorry, I was getting all mixed up. Uh, yes, Judah was the fourth child of Jacob. I believe Reuben was the first, and then it's like, oh, man, I'm going to get mixed up. Is I think it's Reuben, Simon, Levi, then Judah? I think that's correct. I don't know. But Judah, alongside Joseph, is one of the main characters at the ending of the book of Genesis. A lot of the times we spend a lot of time focusing on Joseph, but I recently reread through Genesis, and I actually don't think I'd ever noticed how much of a prominent figure Judah is. A lot of the times he's very famous for the story of Judah and Tamar, which you do read about, and it's a very sad story and a very dark story and a very kind of gross story. But... His story actually is kind of right alongside Joseph's, and he is one of the main characters at the end of the book of Genesis, and that's why he would become so popular later on. Both him and Joseph would go down in history as the people who would basically kind of be almost types of the Messiah. Uh, not a, Judah wasn't necessarily a type of the Messiah, but because of his transition, he ended up getting this amazing promise that we'll talk about in just a second. But even 
Uh, in the light of the rise of Christianity, some rabbinic Judaism, what they had developed is an idea of two messiahs. There was the Messiah bin David and the Messiah bin Joseph, right? So the Messiah son of David, Messiah son of Joseph, David himself would be descended from Judah. So really it's Messiah son of Judah, Messiah son of Joseph, which kind of calls back to the book of Genesis, how these were the two main characters. Originally in the book of Genesis, Judah is, one, is the one who actually suggests that the brothers sell their brother Joseph into slavery. So I don't know if you remember the book of Genesis. Basically, Joseph was this hotshot young kid who was his father's favorite kid. The brothers get jealous and they're going to kill him. But then Judah's the one who says, how about this? Let's sell him into slavery so that we can profit out over this. But by the end of the book, Judah has this radical transformation. And by the end of the book, he's willing to offer himself as a slave in order to preserve the freedom of his brother, Benjamin. And so at the beginning of the story, he's the one who's saying, let's sell our brother into slavery because he's jealous. By the end, he's willing to sell himself into slavery in order to save his brother, Benjamin, who is Joseph's younger brother, and also to preserve the happiness of his father. And so Judah becomes this very selfless figure by the end of the book, and it leads to this very joyful reunion between Joseph and his brothers whenever he has the chance to show them a lot of grace and he gets to encourage them saying what you meant for evil God meant for good it's a very nice solution to the end of the book of Genesis but as a result of this whenever Jacob goes to bless his sons he says something in particular to Judah and he says this the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from, from between his feet that's in Genesis 49 verse 10 and basically what this prophecy is saying, what this blessing is, is that Judah will be the leader amongst all the tribes of Israel. And ultimately what we'll see is that the Messiah himself will come from the people of Judah. Ultimately, David and his entire royal line would come from the line of Judah. When the kingdom split, the southern kingdom was named Judah after the dominant tribe living in that land. Ultimately, after the reign of Solomon, his son Rehoboam is a terrible king, and the kingdom split into the northern kingdom, which preserves the name Israel. Sometimes it's called Ephraim because that was the biggest uh, tribe up there. And then the southern kingdom took on the name Judah. It was predominantly made up of Judah and Benjamin, uh, which is very interesting if you just think about the history there. But Judah was the predominant tribe, and so it became known as Judah. The name Jew actually comes from the word Judah. Uh, whenever the Jews came back from Babylonian captivity later on in the story in the Old Testament, they actually took on the name Jew because they were predominantly the people of Judah. You actually have this whole thing about the lost 10 tribes of Israel because we never actually hear about those guys returning from Assyrian captivity, even though the Bible does make predictions that they one day will. So the Jews come back from Babylonian captivity. They call themselves the Jews. And even to this day, the southern region of Israel is called Judea, right? It's named after Judah. It was Judah and then it turned into Judea. And so I say all that, right? You're, you're probably thinking like, why are you spending all this time? I'm just saying all this because we have to realize whenever you encounter a person named Judas in the Bible, they have a rich, rich history when it comes to their name. And I... For us, we might not necessarily think much about this because whenever we name our kids, we just try to name them something that sounds really cool. But whenever people named their children back in the day, they had a totally different mindset about it. There was weight to this, right? Uh, they're, like they called back upon the history and they were naming them after the historical figures or they were naming them according to the meaning of the word. And so whenever Judas's parents named him Judas, they were either thinking praised, they were thinking Judas Maccabee, or they were thinking Judah, son of Jacob. They were having this stuff in their mind. Maybe they had all of this in their mind, and that's why they named him this. And so I mention all of these details because I want us to realize that these names have a rich historical lineage, and I think that's very important to acknowledge. But let's move on to his nicknames. He actually had three different nicknames, the first of which is Thaddeus, which in Greek is Thaddeus. So it sounds very similar to Thaddeus. <laughs> and this word seems to have meant courageous heart. And along with Andrew and Philip, Thaddeus was one of three apostles with a non-Hebrew name. With Philip and Andrew, we actually only know their Hebrew name. I mean, their Greek name, right? We actually don't know Philip or Andrew's Hebrew name, and that's something we had to wrestle through in those videos. Go check those out if you want to. Also, be sure to like and subscribe to this channel. Uh, but with Thaddeus, we actually do know his Hebrew name, and that is Judas. But he is one of three who seems to have predominantly gone by his Greek name. I mean, we do have some other Greek names in there, like Simon Peter. Simon's Hebrew, Peter's Greek. But it seems like Thaddeus predominantly went by his Greek name, and so he was one of three who predominantly went by that, whereas Simon Peter seemed to go by both together. Jerome, in the 4th century, he's an early church father, he actually called this man Trinomius, and that's because that means the man of three names, because he had three names. He was Thaddeus, he was 
Judas, son of James, and he was also called Labius. And Labius, we'll talk about that in just a second. It seems to be a spinoff of Thaddeus. It seems to be closely related to that. But first, let's talk about Thaddeus a little bit more. Uh, most likely, Thaddeus seems to be the Greek equivalent of the Aramaic Tadai. This is something Richard Bauckham talked about, and we're going to read a quote from Richard Bauckham in a second. And this seems to mean something along the lines of heart or courageous heart, but it's also possible that it comes from the Greek word Theodoros, which is the root of where we get the word Theodore, and this would mean gift of God, much like the Hebrew name Nathaniel. And so it's very possible that Thaddeus could have come from Thor Theodoros, in which case his name is very similar to the name of Nathaniel in the case that they both mean gift of God. But it does seem, just because of the word labius, that nickname, it seems like they might have meant, it might have been in the direction of the Aramaic word tadai, which means courageous heart. Richard Bauckham says this, the name Thaddeus is an example of a Greek name. It could be Theodosios, Theodotos, or Theodoros, which has first been turned into the Semitic shortened version Tadai and has been Greekized uh, again in Thaddeus. Besides our Thaddeus, seven other individuals of this period are known to have been born at, uh, are known to have borne the name in Semitic shortened form. The Greek names were all popular with Jews because of their theophoric character. For example, they incorporate the Greek word for God. Theos, and so resemble many Hebrew names that incorporated either El or Yahweh. And so he's pointing out that the reason why this would have been such a popular name is because of that beginning part, right? Thaddeus, Thea, it, it sounds like God. And so even if it doesn't directly mean God, it sounds like it kind of does. If it's Theodoros, it would, it would mean gift of God, Theodoros, the uh, gift of, or God's gift. Um, but because it sounds like that, it would resemble a lot of Hebrew names because a lot of Hebrew names, they attached Yahweh or El to the name, right? I mean, you have um, Nathaniel, right? Nathan Yel, gift of God. Uh, you have, is it Matt? Um, I'm trying to think of the other ones, right? I'm blanking right now. Why am I blanking? Uh, a lot of these names would have had... <laughs> <laughs> this stuff. Um, but we're, I almost want to speak on it right now. But yeah, so Thaddeus seems to have meant courageous heart. It could also mean gift of God. But the reason why I would lean towards the idea that it does mean courageous heart is because he is also seemingly, possibly, maybe known as Labius. And this is something that we encounter in a few manuscripts, uh, most of which are preserved in the King James and in the New King James versions of the Bible. So if you go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 3 in a King James Bible or a New King James Bible, you will probably read that it says Labius, who was surnamed Thaddeus. Uh, and the reason why we would think this means man of heart is because the Hebrew word for heart is leb or lev. And it seems like it's building off of that. So it would be man of heart. And like we talked about with Thaddeus, that also seems to possibly mean man of heart. And so it's very possible that these are just two different ways of saying the same name. It's Thaddeus or Labius. Either way, he is known as the man of heart. But then he also has a third nickname, and his third nickname is Not Iscariot, which will always amuse me. It always cracks me up whenever we encounter it in the Gospel of John. I mean, it's only one time. It just says, Judas, Not Iscariot, talked to Jesus, and he said this. <laughs> but it cracks me up. It, it's like, that's just really funny. Like, Judas, Not Iscariot. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to be known as that for your entire life? Like, just David, not King David. <laughs> just like, you're just known as that for the rest of your life. Like, that's how much Judas Iscariot changed everything. Like, Judas is like, okay, John, if you mention me by my name Judas, you have to specify I'm not that Iscariot guy. I don't want to be confused with him. And so that just kind of really cracks me up a whole lot. And uh, I don't know if it's supposed to, but I can almost imagine that John put it in there like that just because it's supposed to kind of amuse us a bit. Uh, but yeah, so those are that's his name and nickname, and that's going to be predominantly the only stuff we know about him. But we do know one more thing, and that would be his father's name. His father's name is James or Jacob. And if you've watched our videos on Big James and Little James, you'll know that the name James actually comes from the name Jacob. And there's this whole history behind why we translate it as James instead of Jacob. And it's very convoluted and kind of confusing. And I personally wish that we still translated it as Jacob because once again, that rich history is there from the Old Testament. But this is the Hebrew word Yaakov and in Greek it's Yakabos. And uh, yeah, so that's his dad's name. We read about that in Luke and in Acts. He's Judas, son of James, whereas in Mark and Matthew, he is Thaddeus. And so that's pretty much all we know when it comes to this guy. Everything else is a question mark, pretty much. His mother? I don't know. Siblings? I don't know. There's supposed to be question marks there, but I'm not perfect. I forgot to put them. Spouse? I don't know. He might have had a spouse. We don't know. She's not mentioned. It seems like Peter's the only one uh, married at this time. I don't know. Hometown and place of residence? I don't know. Education? Who knows? Who can tell? <laughs> Language? 
Seems like he probably spoke Aramaic and likely a little bit of Greek and Hebrew as well, just because that's what most people in this time period living in Galilee would have been familiar with. But ultimately, no idea. I can't speak confidently there, and so I'm not going to attempt to, and I'm not going to try to put false information in your head. Occupation? No idea. People try to speculate about this stuff, but this whole channel is called Now Let's Be Honest. And so because of that, I want to be honest with you. There's a lot we don't know about this guy. That's totally fine. We don't have to worry about it. We don't need to know everything. We just need to know his name is Judas slash Jude. His nickname is Thaddeus, possibly Labius. And first and foremost, he is not Judas Iscariot. He wants you to know that. <laughs> um, but yeah, we really don't need to know that much about this guy. We just need to know that he was faithful to God and that he was called by Jesus. That's the main thing we need to know. And I think that's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, so let's move on. How old was Thaddeus? This is stuff that you've seen in every single video. And so I'm going to put all this stuff at the screen at one time. We can just run through it. I'm not going to bore you with this. You've heard it before. Jesus was around 30 years old when he began his ministry. And that was the typical age for a rabbi at that time period. When you look at different historical texts from that time period, 30 was the typical age for a rabbi to begin. And that's consistent with Jesus. Students were usually younger than the rabbis. And Jesus even refers to them as little children, which does suggest to us that they were younger in a line with both the time period and also because the scripture seems to suggest that. Education also ended between ages 12 and 15 and some disciples were already practicing their trades, which suggests to us that they were for, like they were out of their education, but they were still younger than Jesus, which kind of puts them between ages 12 and 30, probably 12 and 27 ish, right? They had to be a little bit younger than Jesus or quite a bit, you know, to be a student. Uh, and it seems like they couldn't have been too developed into their lifestyle that they would just, like, they had to be able to just leave everything. Um, and also they act a lot like kids a lot of times. As far as we know, Simon was the only one who was married at that time. And given that the average age of marriage was 18, it seems like most of the disciples would have been under that age. And this is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And so that suggests to us that possibly at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, Simon was the only one over 18. I mean, it's possible that somebody was 19 and he was just behind getting married, or maybe he didn't want to get married. I don't know. But it does seem to suggest that Simon was the only one, and therefore I'm going to suggest that these guys were probably between the ages of 12 and 18 by that information. But then to go beyond this, as far as we know, by the third year of Jesus' ministry, Simon was the only one who had to pay the temple tax, which began at the age of 20. There is an account in Matthew chapter 17, whenever some people come up to Simon Peter and they say, do you and your master pay the temple tax? And they don't ask about any of the other disciples. They don't say, do you and your fellow disciples and your master? They just say, do you and your master since you start paying the temple tax at age 20, and this is the third year of Jesus' ministry, we can backtrack and say that the disciples seem to have been less than 17 years old when they began to follow Jesus. Ultimately, this is speculation. Ultimately, it doesn't matter that much. I'm just trying to give you information to help maybe make these people come to life in your minds. And so I'm going to conclude, most of the disciples were likely young teenagers at the time they began following Christ, and Thaddeus was likely a young teenager at the time he began following Christ. So what we can say about Thaddeus is the same we can say about most of the disciples. The reason I didn't put 12 to 13 in there is because I think that we have evidence to believe that maybe John was the youngest of the apostles, uh, and maybe him and his brother both were, and so if they were around the same age, maybe 12 and 13, I, I just bumped everybody else above that. Uh, and so it seems like maybe Simon was the oldest, then James and John were the youngest. We don't know for sure. I'm just trying to take the information we have in the Bible and kind of give us a little bit of a theory, but I also want to acknowledge to you that it's a theory so you don't go around telling everybody this dogmatically. But I do think it's very interesting to consider the fact that these guys might have been younger than we typically give them credit. Let's talk about Thaddeus in the Gospels. Uh, this is, this is going to be fun because there's not much to talk about. And in fact, we actually do not know his first encounter or his calling. This is unfortunately the case with most of the apostles, as you will have seen through the majority of these videos. We don't get to see their first encounter with Jesus. We don't get to see their calling. Uh, we just know that they're called to be with Jesus and they're called to be faithful. And I think that's something that's worth noting, right? I mean, uh, I've literally just started this whole recent series on my YouTube channel called Testimony Talks, where I'm having people come on and I'm having them talk about their testimonies in regards to their relationship with God. But one thing you'll notice in those videos is that I'm not wanting to just focus the focus on the salvation experience. Sometimes that's what we reduce our testimony to. And we just talk about this first moment when we became a Christian. I think that's a bit unfortunate because a lot of people just don't remember that moment at all, depending on how young you were. Or maybe there was this long process where you became a Christian over time and you don't know exactly when the spirit came upon you. You don't know that stuff. And so I think it's unfortunate whenever we make testimonies just a single moment. Uh, and I think the Gospels kind of seem to highlight that. We don't know how Thaddeus met Jesus. We don't know how he was called. We just know that he was called 
and he fulfilled that calling. That's what I think we should talk about when it comes to testimonies. Let's talk about how God has been at work in our lives and what we are doing to strive to please him and to live for him and to glorify him. And so that's the case. What we see here with Thaddeus, we don't know much about him. We don't know about his origins. We don't know any of his backstory, but we do know one story from the gospel of John. Thaddeus is only directly mentioned in one story in the gospels when he asks Jesus how he is planning on manifesting himself to the 12, but not to the rest of the world. This is in John chapter 14. And in that chapter, he's not going to be referred to as Thaddeus. He's going to be referred to as Judas, not Iscariot. And what we're going to do right now, we are actually going to walk through the entirety of John chapter 14. This is something that we have spent a lot of time with in the last few weeks in this series because a lot of the apostles come to play. Well, really three of the different apostles, they come to play in this chapter. But I think you need the background of all of this in order to appreciate Thaddeus' stuff whenever you get to verse 22. And so, because context is important, and because we don't have as much to talk about Thaddeus, I figured I'd include this. And so, here's a very brief, not in-depth Bible study on John chapter 14. Maybe one day we will do an in-depth Bible study on it. But for right now, this is brief. We're just looking at it. We're tracking the main points. So this is shortly after Jesus has announced to the disciples, you know, they're, they've been at the Last Supper. He announces to them, I am about to leave. I am about to depart from you. Y'all are going to be left alone. But I need you to go out. I need you to love one another. A new commandment I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. He just washed their feet. They're about to eat the supper. And now he's going to say this to them. Because quite reasonably, they hear this and they've given their entire lives to following this guy. They've been following him for three and a half years. And now he says he's up and leaving. They're scared. So Jesus says this. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you there to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. So Jesus says, I don't want you to be scared that I'm leaving, because if I'm leaving, I promise to come back and get you and bring you to me. This is marriage imagery. It's the idea of a groom going away to prepare a house so that he can come back to his betrothed. They can have the wedding ceremony and he brings them to live with him. That's what Jesus is promising to them. And he says, you know where I'm going. Thomas replies and he says, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? He's very confused. He says, Jesus, you haven't given us directions. We don't have navigation systems. This is first century Israel. How are we supposed to know where you want to go? Jesus says to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. So Jesus says, Thomas, you're mistaken. I'm not talking about physical directions. I myself am the way. If you know me, you know the way to where I'm going because I am the only way you can get there. If you want to get to the Father, you have to go through me. And that's why we as Christians would say that the gospel is very, very exclusive. That's not a popular doctrine nowadays, but it's true. It's never been a popular doctrine. Jesus is the only way to the Father. If you have Jesus, you have the Father. But if you don't have Jesus, you don't have the Father. You have to go through him. But then Philip's confused by this. And Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. Philip's like, okay, hold up. So you're saying we have the Father. Show him to us. He just wants physical revelation. He's like, I want to see God. Jesus says to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. So Jesus says, Philip, once again, you're all wrong. Uh, this is going to be a consistent thing that we see throughout this entire account. The disciples are very confused, like they typically are, and Jesus is always getting on to them saying, you don't get it yet. You don't understand. These guys, once again, they're going to be the leaders of the early church. So this is kind of evidence for scripture, the fact that they're willing to admit that the leaders did not even understand what was going on on the night before Jesus died. <laughs> but Jesus says, you don't understand this. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Not only am I the way to the Father, but I am the physical representation of the Father on earth. I am the image of the invisible God. If you've seen me, you've already seen the Father. You're missing out on the story. But then he continues. Verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And so he says, even as I'm leaving, 
you will now become the images of the Father on earth because I will empower you to do the things that I have done. You will be able to live the same way that I have lived. You will be able to go out and you will share the gospel. You will share the love of Christ, the love that I gave you. You will go out and you will do that for much longer and for a much greater time period than I ever got to. Jesus was here for three and a half years. They're going to be here for a lot longer. And he says, you will be the physical representations of the Father. And then he continues. If you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. And so Jesus says, not only this, not only will it benefit you to be the images of the father on earth in my absence, but when I get to the father, I'm actually going to send you a helper. It's going to be the Holy Spirit of God. He's going to come dwell inside of you and he's going to help you live for me and obey my commandments. And because of this, Jesus reassures them, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. And so Jesus is saying, not only this, but I will come back to you. And whenever you perish, I will bring you to me. And I will manifest myself to those who love me. And now this is where we're going to see Judas come in. This is where we're going to see Thaddeus come in. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? He's confused. He's like, wait, Jesus, if you're the Messiah, if you're the king, and you're bringing about the kingdom of God, how are you only going to reveal yourself to us and not the whole world at the same time? Aren't you supposed to come with all this glorious power? How can it be a secret revelation? How can it be a secret manifestation? I don't get that. What do you mean, Jesus? Why? How could you possibly only reveal yourself to us? Isn't that something that necessitates being big in public? Isn't that what the Old Testament prophesies? Doesn't it say that the Messiah will come and rule and reign in power? How can you only manifest yourself in private? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. And so Jesus seems to be speaking on two different terms here. On one side, he's saying that he will manifest himself to the disciples because if they love him, the spirit will come to dwell in them. And so the father and son are also coming to dwell in them, right? So he's revealing himself to them, but not to the world because the kingdom is of a spiritual sense where it's not necessarily physical at this time period. And so that's how we would say that the kingdom is already, not yet. It's already within us as Christians spiritually, but there's also another sense that Jesus is talking about here when it comes to the physical kingdom, how it is not yet. Because one day he will physically reveal himself to the entire world. But the thing is, that kingdom will ultimately be established only for those who are in Christ. So whenever the kingdom is established, ultimately he's going to come back, he's going to wage war, lay down judgment, the gavel's going to hit the ground, and the world's going to be recreated. And by the time we get to that eternal heaven, whenever we are in and under Christ's reign forever and ever, it's going to be just us with him, right? It's going to be just those who were found in him. And so that's how Jesus is answering, I'm going to manifest myself to you and not to the rest of the world. And then he continues, verse 25, these things I've spoken to you while I am still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And so this is a promise he's not making to all of us. Sometimes people, I've noticed a lot of times people will pluck verses out of John chapter 14, 15, 16, and they'll just apply it to them. You need to understand this in context. Jesus is not saying that the Holy Spirit will always bring everything to remembrance. He's talking specifically to the apostles. And he says, these things I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, like, he's basically just telling them, I'm giving you a whole bunch of new information right now. Like I can't blame, I wouldn't blame you if you forgot some of this. But the Holy Spirit will come and will bring these things back to mind. So this is how we know that what John's reporting is true. John says the Holy Spirit brings it back to my mind and now he's writing it down, right? So he's actually giving glory to God through this by acknowledging that he wasn't just, he didn't have an eidetic memory to where he could just remember everything Jesus said at the Last Supper. No, the Holy Spirit is bringing this stuff back to his mind. And this is why we can trust the eyewitness testimonies of the apostles. And now Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So once again, he knows that they're still going to be troubled and afraid because 
they're confused. He just said he's leaving them, and then he's giving them all these teachings that sound very ominous, very confusing, and they don't know the answers, and every time they try to give an answer, and every time they raise a question, he points out that they don't know what they're talking about. And so you, they would have reason to be troubled and anxious and stuff, but he says, no, I'm giving you my peace. I'm wanting you to stop being afraid. Don't be troubled. Listen to me. Verse 28. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father for the Father is greater than I. I love that verse right there because the disciples, he, Jesus is pointing out a key issue. Man is naturally self-centered and the disciples are hearing that Jesus is leaving and all they can think about is the fact that they are going to be alone. But Jesus says, if you heard the words I'm saying, you would have rejoiced because I get to go be with the Father. And throughout his entire ministry, Jesus has made a point again and again and again to clarify that there is no greater thing to be in the presence of the Father and there's nothing that he wants more than to be in the presence of the Father. We just have to consider what Jesus set aside whenever he came down to earth. He has been dwelling with the Father since eternity past. And he set aside his throne in heaven to come down and dwell with man. And he desperately longed to go back and be in the presence of his Father. And only the next day he would cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's alluding to Psalm 22, but he's also speaking about this true reality that he was more distant from the Father than ever before because the weight of the sin of the world was placed upon him and he was separated from the Father. And so Jesus knows all this stuff and he tells them, guys, you should rejoice. Right now you're just focused on yourselves and you're focused on the fact that you're going to be alone, but you're missing the whole point. I get to go be with the Father. And he's so excited. Then he says, verse 29, and now I have told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. He's, he's functioning in the form of a prophet right now. He says, I don't want you to be surprised by this. Whenever I die, whenever I rise, whenever I go to the Father, I don't want that to take you by surprise and I don't want you to think that I'm a failure or that I didn't tell you this stuff. I'm telling you right here and right now so that when it comes to pass, you will know that I was telling the truth and that I set all this stuff up and that God was orchestrating all of it. That's what he's saying. Verse 30, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the father commanded me so that the world may know that I love the father. I really like that too. Do you see what Jesus' main motivation is for going to the cross? A lot of the times I think that we think that Jesus' main motivation was to love us. That's not his main motivation. His main motivation for going to the cross is to demonstrate his love for the father. You go to John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world, he sent his one and only Son. The Father's main motivation was his love for us. The Son's main motivation was his love for the Father. And ultimately, God is Trinitarian, right? He's three in one. And so, yes, the like one of the most predominant motivations of the whole crucifixion and resurrection thing was love for us. But don't miss that. Jesus' main motivation was love for the Father. Isn't that beautiful? He says, yes, the rule of the world is trying to attack me. He's talking about the devil. And he says, but he's got no claim over me. He thinks he does. He thinks that he's bringing about my death, but God himself is orchestrating all of this. He's using the devil's schemes and God himself is scheming in a way greater than the devil. That even the devil, the greatest schemer of all time, he has no idea what God's got planned. And he says, I'm doing this because the father told me to. And then he says at the end of this chapter, rise, let us go up from here. Uh, it's at this point that he tells the disciples, okay, uh, let's get up and let's walk. And they're going to go in chapters 15 and 16. He's going to be, they're going to be walking to the garden of Gethsemane. They're going to be passing through some vineyards and he's going to say, I'm the vine and you are the branches. And he's going to explain all this stuff to them. And eventually they're going to get to the garden of Gethsemane. He's going to go pray. And eventually he'll be betrayed and marched off and he'll be killed. Uh, but there's John chapter 14. And the main thing that we're wanting to focus on is that question that Thaddeus asked. And so once again, I'll just reread what we have written on the slide here. Thaddeus is only directly mentioned in one story, and that's when he asks Jesus how he's planning on manifesting himself to the twelve, but not to the rest of the world. This is something that the disciples were really struggling with because they didn't understand the nature of Christ's kingdom, and they still didn't even understand this right before Jesus left and whenever he ascended to heaven. If you go to the book of Acts, in chapter 1, they're going to say, okay, Jesus, is now the time for you to bring about the kingdom? And he's like, oh, Gosh, y'all still do not understand. I'm leaving. <laughs> y'all missed that point. Uh, and so this is something that the disciples really wrestled through throughout the entirety of Jesus' ministry. And that's because they had a bunch of preconceived notions about what the Messiah had come to do. This is what D.A. Carson has to say about this whole passage, particularly about Thaddeus' question. 
In view of the fact that none of the disciples entertained very clear notions of the resurrection of Christ before the fact, it is unlikely that Judas is specifically asking how it is Jesus will show himself in his resurrection body um, to the disciples and not to the world. By the same reasoning, his question cannot be taken as a clear reference to the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, he's basically just talking about what we can't assume this is talking about. He's not talking about the resurrection when it talks about manifesting yourself because they didn't seem to understand the resurrection. They also didn't seem to understand the spirit thing, so that can be what he's referencing about. Rather, Judas hears these, uh, rather, Judas hears these distinctions between what the world will perceive or be given and what the disciples will enjoy, and in his mind he cannot square this distinction with his belief that the kingdom must arrive in undeniable and irresistible splendor. If Jesus is the messianic king, then he must startle the world with apocalyptic self-disclosure. And once again, this is stuff that's rooted in the Old Testament. The Old Testament talks about the Messiah showing up in power and glory. Go read the book of Daniel, and it talks about the Son of Man riding on the clouds and all these things. Very public affairs. And it seems like that's what Judas is wrestling through right here. Gerald L. Borcher, he says this in his, uh, gospel, uh, his commentary on the Gospel of John. The question of Judas is clearly that of a confused person. It is hardly likely that he was asking for Jesus to expound upon the aspects of the resurrection. How could he ask such a question when that idea would hardly have crossed his mind? Was he in this story then thinking about Jesus' coming? Probably not. But such conclusion does not mean that the evangelist was unaware of the theophanic overtones in this statement. Right? So this is one of those things where uh, it seems like John, as an author, he does this a lot throughout the gospel. He includes questions that... The disciples mean one thing by it, or the characters mean one thing by it, but as a reader, you read even greater theology into it. Because John, he's writing this later at the end of the first century, probably, and he's reflecting on a long life of developed theology and all this stuff, and he's looking back on these remembrances of his time with his friend in Galilee, and he realizes how close they were, but how far they were at the same time. And so there's certain things, like certain questions that everybody asks, and they're like, oh man, that's actually deeper than you even realized. And so it seems like John does that a whole lot within his gospel. And so just in this one chapter, I just wanted to recap something that we've talked about both in the Thomas video and the Philip video, and now also in this video. Uh, there were three nuggets of key truth found in John chapter 14. First off, Thomas asks the question, how can we know the way, specifically the way to the Father? The first nugget of truth is that Jesus is the only way to God. This is the exclusivity of the gospel. He's the only way. Secondly, Philip says, show us the Father. To this, we get our second nugget of truth. Those who know Christ know the Father. So not only is Jesus the only way to the Father, but if you know Christ, you also know the Father because these two are one. Thirdly, Judas, not Iscariot, aka Thaddeus, he says, how will you manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And this give a, gives us our third nugget of truth, which is father and son make their home with the believer through the spirit, right? And so we actually see how just in this chapter alone, we have the Trinitarian doctrine really fleshed out. Jesus is the only way to the father, but the um, but if you know Jesus, you know the father. And if you know the father and the son, you're going to receive the spirit because they are three in one. Boom, right? That's really cool how just in John chapter 14 we get this fleshed out. And that's one of the very unique things about the whole Last Supper discourse in John chapters 13 through 17. If you go through those, we have our most Trinitarian doctrines explained right there. And that's why those teachings are so, 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 so crucial. Uh, but that's the only thing we know about Thaddeus uh, in particular in the Gospels. Other than that, we can just say what we know about him in regards to his life as a disciple. And he's consistently listed in the third group of the 12. He's listed either in 10th place or in 11th place. Uh, and it basically just depends on which gospel you read, right? In Matthew and Mark, he's called Thaddeus. And in that place, he's listed 10th. But if you go to Luke and in Acts, both of which were written by Luke, who was a companion of Paul, he's referenced as Judas, son of James, or Judas of James. Some people would suggest that this actually means that they were brothers, right? Judas of James. Uh, it could be he had a brother named James, but that doesn't seem to be how these people would typically reference brothers. And so, other than that, we can just say that, like the rest of the twelve, Thaddeus was appointed by Jesus, he traveled with Jesus, he received insight to Jesus' teachings, he was sent out to preach, he baptized people, he performed miracles, he was challenged by Jesus' teachings, he heard Christ predict his death, but nevertheless, he still fled at Christ's arrest. But then, three days later, he saw the resurrected Christ, and 40 days after that, he witnessed the ascension. And that's all we can say about Thaddeus in the Gospels, which leads us to talk about Thaddeus in Acts and the Epistles. 
But unfortunately, kind of like with the majority of these apostles, Thaddeus is only mentioned once in the book of Acts. He is called Judas, son of James, and is never mentioned again in the epistles at all or in Revelation, uh, which I guess does have kind of an epistolary format at the very beginning because there's some letters to the churches, but it's primarily apocalyptic. So along with the rest of the apostles, Thaddeus would have been present at the ascension of Christ, which also we saw, you know, in the gospels. Um, then also when they replaced Judas Iscariot, when the spirit fell at Pentecost, when Peter delivered the first sermon in, establishing, in the establishing of the Jerusalem church, as the Jerusalem church continued to grow, when the high priest began to arrest the apostles, and when they appointed the seven deacons. Other than that, we're not really totally sure where the twelve apostles were at, but it seems like they might have all stayed relatively in Jerusalem until Acts chapter 12, whenever, Judas, uh, whenever um, James, son of Zebedee, was killed. Uh, and that began the second wave of persecution. This is around A.D. 44. And so around that time period, it seems like the 12 apostles finally went out and they started ministering. And that's something that we do see. I mean, if you just go through the book of Acts, it seems like they would have all been there together with one another for maybe the first 14 years or so. Maybe they traveled here and there every now and then. But predominantly, the 12 apostles were gathered there. And then once James, son of Zebedee, is killed, they start spanning out and they start going and sharing the gospel with the rest of the nations. Up until that point, it was primarily Paul uh, who had started kind of doing some of the st stuff like that. But yeah, so that's all we know about Judas in, or Thaddeus, Judas, whatever you want to call him. I'm going to call him Thaddeus. Uh, that's all we know about Thaddeus in the Bible. So let's move on to Thaddeus according to ooh, tradition. <laughs> uh, I'm never going to get tired of doing that. Uh, so, okay. <laughs> Real quick, I need a swig of water because my throat is getting kind of tired. All right. Travels and traditions. Let's talk about some travels and traditions when it comes to our boy Thaddeus. Some have argued that Thaddeus was a zealot, much like Simon the Zealot, because the Coptic, uh, because some Coptic manuscripts of the Gospel of John identify him as Judas the Canaanite, similar to Simon the Zealot's other title, Simon the Cananean. Uh, and so whenever you compare these, some people suggest that he might have been a zealot, and this is what Sean McDowell says in The Fate of the Apostles. Whether or not Thaddeus was a zealot, he was always placed next to Simon in the apostolic lists, which has led some to conclude that they were close friends or ministry partners. And so I would lean away from the idea that he is a zealot because it's just not mentioned clearly. Um, but there does seem to possibly have been some sort of association between him and Simon the Zealot because they're always right next to each other in the list of the 12 apostles. And so they could have been ministering partners or maybe they were related. I don't know. Um, but... There are Coptic manuscripts that call him Judas the Canaanite, which is kind of similar to Canaanian. And so that is a possible tradition. There is an early tradition. Uh, it's actually very extended, and we're going to read a good chunk of it in just a second. This comes from Eusebius in his book, Church History, which is, uh, Eusebius is called the father of church history because his book, Ecclesiastical or Church History, is the earliest collection of church history that we have. It comes from the fourth century. And he records that Jesus sent Thaddeus to Edessa to preach, evangelize, and heal King Abgar V. Uh, and Abgar lived around AD 13 to AD 50. And so this actually would have taken place during the ministry of Jesus, which is very, very interesting. Uh, and so that's why I actually wanted to spend time on this account because it actually records letters being written back and forth between people and stuff like that. And I just thought that was unique. But keep in mind, once again, this is tradition. Take it with a grain of salt. I just found the account very, very intriguing. And so this is what Eusebius says. Like I said, buckle up. This is going to be a long read. The divinity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, being reported abroad among all men on account of his wondrous working power, he attracted countless numbers of for, uh, from foreign countries lying far away from Judea, who had the hope of being cured of their diseases and of, and of all kinds of sufferings. So basically, Jesus got really popular, and now foreign people were looking for him for help. For instance, the king Abgarus, also known as Abgar. The king Abgarus, who ruled with great glory the nations beyond the Euphrates, being afflicted with a terrible disease, which it was beyond the power of human skill to cure, when he heard the name of Jesus and of his miracles, which were attested by all, uh, by all with one accord, sent a message to him by a courier and begged him to heal his disease. But Jesus did not at that time comply with his request. Yet he deemed him worthy of a personal letter in which he said that he would send one of his disciples to cure his disease and at that same time promise salvation to himself and all his house. And so King Abgar, uh, and once again, King Abgar is a historical figure that we know about who ruled during that time period on the screen. 
He hears about Jesus and he decides that he needs some healing. And so he writes to Jesus, but Jesus didn't think that at that moment that was necessarily one of his priorities, but he does necessarily, he does at the same time think that Abgar does deserve to be healed and that that is going to be a priority at some point. And so he does promise that one day one of his apostles will come and heal him. And he writes a letter to Abgar about this. We continue. Not long afterward, his promise was fulfilled. For after his resurrection from the dead and his ascent into heaven, Thomas, one of the 12 apostles, under divine impulse, sent Thaddeus, who was also numbered amongst the 70 disciples of Christ, to Edessa as a preacher and evangelist of the teaching of Christ. And so right here, according to this early tradition, Thaddeus is actually a reference to a member of the 70, not necessarily a member of the 12. That's actually very intriguing. Um, but this is saying that now... Um, Jesus heard from Abgar during his ministry, but after Jesus died, he resurrected and he ascended. Now you're going to see the fulfillment of this where Thaddeus is going to be sent over there to Edessa to ultimately heal Abgar. We continue. And all that our Savior had promised received through him its fulfillment. You have written evidence of these things taken from the archives of Edessa, which was at that time a royal city. For in the public registers there, which contain accounts of ancient times and the acts of Abgaris, these things have been found preserved down to the present time. But there is no better way than to hear the epistles themselves, which we have taken from the archives and have literally translated from the Syriac language in the following manner. So this is where it gets really exciting. Because what we've read so far is the entire story. But now Eusebius says that he has actually gained access to the archives from this area. And he has translated it into our language so that well into his language and then that's been translated to English in order for us to understand what's going on and so this is actually really unique because this is Eusebius writing in the fourth century but he says he has accessed these information from earlier on from the archives in that area and so wherever these letters come from they seem to have dated well before the fourth century which once again even though the story seems very uh, embellished nevertheless it might have a grain of truth to it just because of how early it is and so he's actually going to give us the translations of these letters. This is the copy of an epistle written by Abgarus, the ruler to Jesus and sent to him at Jerusalem by Ananias, the swift courier. So first we're going to start off with a letter written by the king to Jesus. This is what Jesus received and what Jesus is going to respond to. The letter says this, Abgarus, ruler of Edessa, to Jesus, the excellent savior who has appeared in the country of Jerusalem. Greetings. I have heard the reports of you and of your cures as performed by you without medicines or herbs. For it is said that you make the blind to see and the lame to walk, and that you cleanse lepers and cast out impure spirits and demons, and that you heal those afflicted with lingering disease and raise the dead. And having heard all these things concerning you, I have concluded that one of two things must be true. Either you are God, and having come down from heaven, you do these things, or else you who does these things are the Son of God. I have therefore written to you to ask if you would take the trouble to come to me and help the disease which I have. For I have heard that the Jews are murmuring against you and are plotting to injure you. But I have a very small yet noble city, which is great enough for us both. And so Abgarus, he actually writes to Jesus and he's like, hey, I heard a lot about you and I've become convinced that you're, you're the bee's knees, man. You're pretty cool. I was wondering if you wanted to come live over here and help me out because I know the Jews have kind of turned against you, but I'd really, I could use some help. And so now we read the answer of Jesus to the ruler Abgarus by the courier Ananias. This is really cool because now, I mean, once again, this is traditional. We don't know if it's true, but it, it was at least an early tradition. Eusebius is writing in the fourth century. This dates even earlier because this is stuff that Eusebius got from archives. So we don't know how early this is. It's probably embellished. That's fine, but it's kind of unique because what we're about to read is a letter that comes from Jesus himself to Abgaris. He says this, Blessed are you who hast believed in me without having seen me. You have kind of the overtones of the Gospel of John there, right? You, that's once again, you can tell it's embellished a little bit. For it is written concerning me that they who have seen me will not believe in me, and that they who have not seen me will believe and be saved. But in regard to what you have written me, that I should come to you, it is necessary for me to fulfill all things here for which I have been sent, and after I have fulfilled them thus to be taken up again to him that sent me. But afterward I have been taken up, I will send you one of my disciples, that he may heal your disease and give life to you and yours. This is really cool because this is actually, uh, it's actually consistent with what we see about the character of Jesus as it's presented in the Gospels. Jesus has people who are foreigners coming up to him and Jesus says, hey, my priority is with the people of Israel. But usually he is still gracious to them and he reaches out to them in some form or fashion. Whenever he does ascend, 
Finally, the apostles are the ones who are sent out to the Gentiles. And so this is very, very consistent with the biblical account. It's probably embellished, but it's still very cool how these do line up very well. And that's the end of the letter. Now Eusebius continues. Further accounts. To these epistles, there was added the following account in the Syriac language. After the ascension of Jesus, Judas, who was also called Thomas, sent to him Thaddeus, an apostle, one of the seventy. Thaddeus began then in the power of God to heal every disease and infirmity, insomuch that all wondered. And when Abgarus heard of the great and wonderful things that of which he did, and of the cures which he performed, he began to suspect that he was the one of whom Jesus had written him, saying, After I have been taken up, I will send to you one of my disciples who will heal you. And so this is just the story continuing after the letters, as Eusebius found according to the archives. The story says that Abgarus saw this Thaddeus guy going around, and he was like, this must be one of the guys that Jesus said he was going to send. It continues. Therefore, summoning Tobias, with whom Thaddeus lodged, he said, I have heard that a certain man of power has come and is lodging in your house. Bring him to me. And Thaddeus said, I will go, for I have been sent to him with power. And immediately upon his entrance, a great vision appeared to Abgarus in the countenance of the apostle Thaddeus. When Abgarus saw it, he prostrated himself before Thaddeus. He then asked Thaddeus if he were in truth a disciple of Jesus, the Son of God, who had said to him, I will send you one of my disciples who shall heal you and give you life. And Thaddeus said, Because you have mightily believed in him, that sent me. Therefore have I been sent unto you. And immediately Abgarus was cured of the disease and of the suffering which he had. The same Thaddeus cured also many other inhabitants of the city and did wonders and marvelous works and preached the word of God. Abgarus therefore commanded the citizens to assemble early in the morning to hear the preaching of Thaddeus, and afterward he ordered gold and silver to be given him. But Thaddeus refused to take it, saying, If we have forsaken that which was our own, how shall we take that which is another's? These things were done in the 340th year. And so Eusebius ends this story by recounting that Abgarus wanted to pay Thaddeus for all that he had done. But Thaddeus says, no, I'm not accepting payment. This was out of the gracious love of God. And so Eusebius concludes, I have inserted them here in the proper place, translated from the Syriac literally, and I hope to good purpose. So Eusebius himself, this is why he's called the father of church history. He's done his research. He got these things from the archives. He's reporting it. He's not saying it's true. This is just a story that was reported and therefore he records it down. I think that's just really unique. I think that's really cool. And what I just read to you was actually a condensed version of that. I actually kind of, that's the abridged version that I actually just like, I put a lot of ellipses in there and I just kind of read through it. Uh, but if you want the full account, go read Church History. It's in uh, book one, chapter 13. So go check that out. Uh, but it's really unique and that's kind of a cool story and it seems to be fairly early. Uh, traditional locations attributed to the missionary work of Thaddeus are all over the map, making it difficult to be confident in which are true. Some locations include Syria, according to the Coptic tradition, uh, Edessa, according to Eusebius, as we just read, and also according to the Acts of Thaddeus, uh, also Persia and Mesopotamia, and then finally Armenia, uh, and that's specifically from the Armenian tradition, and this is what Sean McDowell has to say regarding the Armenian tradition and Thaddeus. He says this, The Armenian tradition is ancient and unvarying that the Apostle Thaddeus was one of its apostolic founders. The Armenian church is convinced Thaddeus was the first evangelist in the country and that he died there as a martyr. The evidence may not be as strong as the Armenian church insists, but it is not impossible. And so it is possible that Thaddeus did go to Armenia. And then we do have, like, once again, the uh, story we just read. We have early traditions that he did go to Edessa uh, and also Syria. So we really have no idea uh, where he traveled to. We can't say confidently, but all these different places are possibilities and so i thought i would include them here let's talk about the fate of thaddeus let's wrap this bad boy up so that we can get out of here uh, fate of thaddeus there is no shortage of traditions regarding thaddeus's fate and i'm not kidding there are so so many and i just tried to include some of the earliest ones uh, the first and foremost uh he died peacefully in syria that is one tradition that's according to the coptic tradition or there's another Coptic tradition that suggests that he was shot with arrows and stoned to death in Syria. So both of these are deaths in Syria. One, he dies peacefully. One, he's shot with arrows and then he's stoned to death. Uh, I couldn't actually find any uh, original accounts of this, but I am going to read what Sean McDowell says here uh, because he has done his research and he can put it a lot more concise than I can. He says this, A Coptic tradition reports that Thaddeus, Judas, preached and died in Syria. According to the account, Peter joins Thaddeus as they preach, cast out evil spirits, and heal the wounded and sick. In their preaching, the apostles incorporate well-known teachings of Jesus. After their ministry was finished, Thaddeus died peacefully and Peter continued on his way. 
However, a separate tradition exists of this ministry and fate in Syria where Thaddeus is shot with arrows and stoned to death. Yikes. <laughs> but those are the first two, right? Those are just the first two. We've got plenty more to come. And so, so the first two traditions we got is that he died in Syria, either peacefully or being shot with arrows and stoned. Next, we do have a tradition that he died peacefully in Edessa. This comes from both Hippolytus on the 12, which is from the 4th century, and the Acts of Thaddeus in the 5th century. I'm going to read the Acts of Thaddeus for you first, and then Hippolytus. Acts of Thaddeus reads this. Having therefore remained with them for five years, Thaddeus built a church. And having appointed a bishop, uh, one of his disciples, and presbyters and deacons, and prayed for them, he went away, going around the cities of Syria, and teaching, and healing all the sick. Whence he brought many cities and countries to Christ through his teaching. Teaching, therefore, and evangelizing along with the disciples, and healing the sick, he went to Berytus, a city of Phoenicia by the sea. And there, having taught and enlightened many, he fell asleep on the 21st of the month of August. And the disciples, having come together, buried him with great honor, and many sick were healed, and they gave glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. I'm assuming that Beritus must be a synonym for Edessa there. Uh, either that or I just have it wrong here on my uh, notes. But um, Hippolytus definitely is going to say Edessa in a second. But right here in the Acts of Thaddeus, it does have him dying in Beritus. Maybe those are similar to uh, each other or something like that. I'm not totally sure. But right here, it's, it's another tradition of him dying peacefully at least. And then in Hippolytus, we read this. Jude, who is also called Labius, preached to the people of Edessa and to all Mesopotamia and fell asleep at Beritus and was buried there. Okay, yeah. So I guess Beritus is in Edessa. So that makes more sense. <laughs> uh, so he died in Berita, uh, Beritus in Edessa and uh, that would have been a peaceful death as well. Right? And so this, the reason I'm sharing all these is because a lot of the times as Christians, we overstate our facts. And we say that every single one of the apostles, except for the apostle John, died a martyr's death. We don't know that. We, we genuinely just do not know. Uh, we actually have martyrdom traditions for every single one of the apostles. Every single one of them. Uh, even John. <laughs> uh, but really, we just do not know. And so I'm trying to just kind of show that to you. Um, we have good reason to think that the Apostle Paul died a martyr's death. We have good reason to think that the Apostle Peter died a martyr's death. Beyond that, it's just kind of guesswork. And that's why I'm trying to make these videos very in-depth. And I'm trying to go back to the earliest traditions just so that you know what type of information we're dealing with. But moving on, we also have another tradition that he was killed with swords in Swinar, Persia. And this comes from Pseudo Abdius, which dates to the 6th and 7th century. And it costs a lot of money. Uh, that's supposed to say Abdius, not Abdrius. Once again, me and my typos. Um, but once again, uh, this stuff, it, it, it gets kind of expensive to purchase. <laughs> uh, and so rather than purchasing this, I actually just am going to reference Sean McDowell's work again. And uh, this is what Sean says. Western tradition pairs Simon and Judas Thaddeus together as missionaries and martyrs. This is specifically speaking of Simon the Zealot, I believe. The Latin pseudo Abdius places their activities in Persia, where they encounter the two sorcerers Zeroes and Arphaxat, who Matthew had expelled from Ethiopia. As they travel throughout Egypt and Babylon, Simon and Judas win multiple spiritual disputes with the two magicians. Even though Simon and Judas spare their lives, the magicians continue to follow the apostles and heckle them in every city they enter. Nevertheless, the two apostles win many converts, ordain deacons, and found multiple churches. They even ordain Abdius, the supposed writer of these stories, who became bishop of Babylon. The story further reports that the religious leaders in the city of Swinar, Persia, eventually arrest Simon and Judas, allowing them either to worship statues of the sun and moon or die. They choose martyrdom and are killed with swords. After their deaths, a lightning bolt strikes the temple and splits it into three parts. Zeroes and Afraxat are also struck and their bodies are incinerated. The Latin Hernomian Martyrology, 5th century, also reports the Persian city of Swinar as the place and passion of their passion and their death. And I'm presuming that that is what this picture right here is portraying. Because as you can see, it's pretty gruesome. I mean, you have like, oh, it's actually, <laughs> I don't think I ever really took the time to really look at this. Uh, this is the martyrdom of St. Judith, of St. Jude Thaddeus from the 14th century, and it's by Pomerancio. And uh, as you can see here, this is Thaddeus on the ground. Somebody's stepping on his stomach. His foot is chopped off. His arm is chopped off. And his hand is chopped off off of the dismembered arm. And so very, very brutal. And uh, yeah, so yikes. But it seems like that's what it's depicting. But we do have other traditions. <laughs> Fifthly, he died in a uh, 
unspecified manner in Armenia. Uh, and since it's unspecified, I would assume this is likely in a peaceful manner. And this comes the from the this comes from the Breviarium Apostolorum, uh, and this is from the uh, AD 600. It reads this: Jude Thaddeus, which means confessor, was a brother of James, and he preached in Mesopotamia and the inlands of Pontus. He is buried in the city of Neritus in Armenia, and his feast is celebrated on October 28th. And so we actually would have just recently passed that feast, uh, very recently, just a few weeks ago. But yeah, so uh, this guy actually says that Thaddeus or Jude means confessor, which is interesting. Uh, but he says that he died in Armenia, but he doesn't specify exactly how he died. And then we have one more tradition that says that uh, Thaddeus was pierced with arrows in Eret, Armenia. There are other traditions in addition to this, but these are really all of the main traditions that we have associated with Thaddeus and his death. And therefore, we will come to our conclusions. And that being said, we really have no way of determining precisely how Thaddeus died. We simply don't know. Once again, this has been the case with a few of the apostles, and I don't want that to be disappointing to you. I think that's fine. We don't need to know how he died. We can ask him when we get to heaven, and maybe he'll tell us <laughs> if we're really nice to him. Uh, but this is what Sean McDowell concludes. Uh, Thaddeus engaged in missionary work outside Jerusalem. This is very probably true. We have good reason to think this because there are so many early traditions saying that he did so. Thaddeus experienced martyrdom, that's as plausible as not. With some of these apostles, we have good reason to think that they were martyred. We just don't know how. But with him, we've got so many accounts of him dying peacefully. I mean, out of these six that I've listed here, it seems like three of them are peaceful, three of them are not. And so it's very possible that he just died a normal death. And that's totally, totally fine. I'm just including this stuff because I don't want us to overstate our case. I think that's very important because I think that we're being a little bit dishonest, both academically and spiritually, whenever we are overstating our case. This is what Sean McDowell says in conclusion. Accounts of his peaceful death and his martyrdom occur in both Eastern and Western traditions. There seem to be independent lines of his martyrdom, but also independent lines of his natural death. Traditions vary considerably as to when, how, why, where, and whether he died as a martyr, which could mean that there was no known fate for Thaddeus and stories could be invented out of thin air to meet the theological needs of various communities. There could also be some truth in one or more of these traditions that remains amid the legendary exaggeration. The truth is elusive. And I think he does that very well. Once again, Fate of the Apostles is another book that I've been recommending almost every single video. And that's because it's very, very good. And it's probably the best resource I have found. And I mean, it is. It's not probably. It is the best resource I have found regarding the fates of these various apostles. So its title lives up to, I mean, its content lives up to its title. Uh, but, yo, there is everything we have to say about Thaddeus, also known as Judas, son of James, also known as Judas, not Iscariot. And with that, we have finally covered ten apostles. Ten of them. We've only got two left. we got Simon the Zealot, and then we have Judas Iscariot. I'm nervous to go through the Judas Iscariot one, though. So, Simon the Zealot, that one's going to be a pretty easy one, because I don't think we know that much about him, but I'm still excited to look into it. I'm sure we'll spend a lot of time talking about who the Zealots were and stuff like that, and whether or not he was a Zealot, or whether he was zealous. I'm excited for that one. Judas Iscariot, man, I don't know. I've got so much to say about Judas. Literally, I have thought about writing a book about Judas, and maybe one day I will. So that one might end up having to be two videos. I'm not sure. We'll see. Uh, I'll, whenever I finally get all my stuff together, I'll just see how much time I want to spend on it. I easily could do five videos on it, but I'll spare you that. And we'll see how long I actually decide to talk about it. But thank you so much for watching this. Thank you for just being faithful to watch all these videos. I think it's been really fun. I've been enjoying engaging with you in the comments and talking about this stuff. I've just been enjoying kind of getting to know this community more and more. I've been doing more live streams and stuff like that. It's been very, very fun for me. And so thank you. I really appreciate that. Be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, turn on notification bell, do all that stuff. Share it with your friends, share it with your family, share it with a stranger that you don't even know. But thank you. I really do appreciate it. I cannot state that enough. The fact that y'all would watch these videos and just listen to me talk for hours and hours and hours on end. It really is humbling to me. Uh, it means a lot and I do appreciate that. So thank you. And um, your viewership does not go unnoticed or unappreciated. Uh, thank you. So, uh, yeah, I'll see y'all next time. Uh, well, I'm probably going to have different videos in between. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I got to figure it out week by week. But uh, I will see y'all next time for Lives of the Apostles number 15, where we are going through our 11th apostle, Simon the Zealot. Until then, be sure to keep a smile on your face. Don't let anybody steal your joy. And I will see you guys later.
So your brother offered a sacrifice and God liked it better than yours. And the Lord is always telling you sin is crouching at your door. Now I know you want to take a big old rock and bop your brother on the side of the head. But just take a breath and hear me out cause I got something you can do instead. You gotta watch and pray lest you fall into temptation.